Welcome to Tattooed Freaks in Business Suits, recorded live in my house, that is also a part of the Personal Touch Career Services in Denver, Colorado. I am your host, Donna Shannon. As a professional career coach, I help people navigate the hiring maze to get the jobs they really love. In addition to working with job seekers one-on-one, I do have a book available. You can find Get a Job Without Going Crazy on Amazon. Today, my guest is Nate Stevens, who's actually a tattoo artist. I'm so excited. Uh, But we're also going to explore some other revenue streams that he's made for himself during all this COVID crisis. So uh, a little bit more about our show. Our purpose is to explore and redefine the world of work, especially as Gen X millennials and those to come after seek positions of leadership that still allow them to be themselves. So every show we explore a topic related to business or job searching. And of course, we're going to talk about tattoos. Our sponsor is the Personal Touch Career Services, Denver's top rated career coaching service. We focus on the practical tools for your job search, including resumes, LinkedIn profiles, job search coaching, and ongoing classes. So check out our ridiculously long website, personaltouchcareerservices.com. Once again, that's personaltouchcareerservices.com, or you know, you can just Google it. So hi, Nate. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. I'm doing real good. Great, great. So let's just kind of dive into things. Why don't you just tell us a little bit more about you and your art and uh, all the rest of the things that go with that? Oh, man, I always did. This is a long story, Um, but I think it pairs well with what you're doing. So I started tattooing later in life. I started tattooing when I was 28. I'm 36 now. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I had like a what I call like a grown up job. I had I told, I joke that I used to put a costume on and talk to old white people about stuff I didn't care about. And I was a, I was a debt buyer mm. for a company called square two financial. So we would buy charged off portfolios, credit card debt. I wore a legit, like a fancy suit and tie every day for about five years. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like it. And like, I was, didn't like who I was becoming. I actually became an alcoholic. I got sober. That was about eight years ago and made the, at the time, like the very scary decision to do what made me happy, not what made me money. Mm -hmm. Because that was always my goal. Like the next big promotion, the next raise, that will, that'll make me happy. And it never did. Mm -hmm. So I made the shift. Thankfully, I've been getting tattooed by Ryan Willard at Marion Street Tattoo at that point for a couple of years, because I was pretty heavily tattooed for a guy that wore a suit every day. And Mm -hmm. I I like that, knowing that, because I meet people every day that don't want to get, I can't go down here because my job. I'm pretty sure my job was a little crazier than yours. And I had tattoos down there and you just have to wear sleeves. You got to wear sleeves anyway, you know, like suits don't come with short sleeves. Right. <laughs> right. Unless you're a woman, then sometimes they do. Yeah. 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 Well, we <laughs> golf, we golfed all the time. Like that was our requirement of my old job. Mm-hmm. So I would just wear a compression sleeve on my left arm because I went down to my wrist already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I made that decision. I started my apprenticeship in August of 2012. So we're almost exactly eight years out. And I, Ryan initially told me, like, you want to trade all that in for tattooing? Like, this seems crazy. But he said, just start showing up, like, maybe a couple days a week, see if it's something you really like to do. And then I'm, I never left. I'm still there, which is mm-hmm. also rare in the tattoo world. Usually you do an apprenticeship and you move on or you have a falling out with your mentor or something like that. But I, I'm still there. Just, I'm going there later today. I show up there all the time. So cool. that was a... Uh, that's kind of like the the foundation is why I ended up in tattooing in the first place was a little backwards, like later in life awakening, if you will. Nice. But it's really, it's really cool that you got to follow your passion and you know, the recognition of what makes you happy versus success and whatever somebody else might define that as. Well, and, and finding that, that middle ground too. Cause in the, at that time, I mean, obviously I think the last 10 weeks have shown what income can do like when you lose it. So it Mm -hmm. reminded me like, it's not always, there's a balance, you know, like most things in life, you have to balance it. So income is definitely important, but it shouldn't be your only driving factor. And that's what drove me for a long time. Like I went to, I have a bachelor's from Colorado state and then I have a graduate degree from DU law school and legal administration. And it was always like, that was my driving force. Like, what can I accomplish next? And 
it ruined personal relationships. It changed a lot of things because I was so reckless about it. Like there wasn't wasn't the thoughtfulness to what I was doing. It was just how much money can I get in my bank account? Cool. I get to draw cartoons for a living, which is sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and put them on skin so they last mm-hmm. forever. <laughs> yeah, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the things that I did want to point out, because I don't think, unless you were aware of people in the industry, is just how bad the COVID shutdown hit tattoo artists and piercers in mm-hmm. the shops. Mm-hmm. So what was the immediate impact on your business? Uh, it went from like 100 to zero, the opposite of what you always hear. Like um, mm-hmm. our shop is, our shop's busy. It's uh, on a Saturday, we'll see 30, 35 tattoos get done because there's Mm -hmm. seven of us where it's it's a heavy walk-in shop. Me and Ryan, the owner, we've been appointment only for a while. Like I'm fortunate enough that I've developed a pretty specific style. People seek me out to do that. But the shop in general has always just been, it's popping all the time. And we saw it coming in the media and stuff because we were paying attention. We have a Friday the 13th tattoo event that is huge. Mm -hmm. It's usually around like in between like 700 and 800 people come through the shop on that day so when we started seeing i think it was the nba the first one that closed down early march Mm -hmm. we had about a week of conversations like do we continue with friday the 13th knowing Mm -hmm. that it's a big day for everybody in the shop everybody in the shop makes a lot of money on that day and we get a lot of exposure like it's a big day no matter Mm -hmm. when it is and it's usually two a two a year or something like that We had already taken donations. We were donating some, like if you make a donation, you get to cut the line a little bit. You get into a faster line, cut your wait time down. And we'd taken donations for about a month for, um, I think this time we were doing like autism awareness or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot, like on the line, people already had given money, like things were happening. And it was a difficult decision, but we decided like we can't do this, like despite... All the money involved and everything, like for the greater community, based on what we're seeing and how it's affecting everyone. And there was a lot of unknowns at the time. Like it was like drinking out of a fire hose. The information came fast. Mm -hmm. So we decided to cancel it. And that was, we decided on March 12th, like the day before. And given the, like people start lining up at sometimes the night before. So we had to tell people via social media, because that's our primary marketing tool. And then we just had to be closed the next day because we knew that people would probably still show up that didn't get the message another Mm -hmm. way. So we were closed March 13th and I haven't been back to work since. Wow. So initially there was a, well now I'm now, it's May 9th now, now things are back, but real weird. We can talk about that a little bit. uh, Initially it was terrifying. Like I, there was a point where, Cause I have a, a one year old and then my wife who's a stay at home mom. So I'm, I've been the sole provider for since he was born last March. So mm-hmm. 14 months ago. And there was definitely like, I broke down at one point when the bathroom and I cried a little bit. Cause Holy shit. Like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Like, I was like, like I'm the only one. So then, then you, you start thinking about different things. Like there's certain, do I go get a job at Amazon? Do I get a job cutting grass? Like, what do I do next? Mm-hmm. Um, and then that's when the, the, the t-shirts evolved like that what do i do now there was talk of like i mean everyone heard like the the federal assistance that kind of stuff was on the way but nobody knew when there was a lot right. of like i mean this is still i tell my clients this like we, i talk about COVID all day because everyone does and i'm a talker when i tattoo people i think it helps get through the process so that's usually the topic nowadays like what'd you do the last 10 weeks when we weren't allowed to do anything mm-hmm. but if you think back to like right at the end of March, beginning of April, that's when ever the fear was the highest. Everyone was locked down. Basically, like nothing at that point was unaffected by a shutdown. Either mm-hmm. you were working from home, working partway a little bit, or when you were going to work, you were one of the few people going to work and you were like, this is weird. I don't know why I'm, I'm out here right now. And I still, yeah, that was, there was nothing coming in. So I'm look, I'm doing the math. Like how much money do I have in my bank account? How much money do I have in my business bank account? How much money do I have in the safe? Like, like how can we make this last and then we just cut all expenses like just which was easy because it's not like there's anything fun you can spend money on when they shut it all down right right that was it was scary the term independent contractor became just really loud like you when you're in the shop all the time yeah you've got seven eight people around you but when it shut down it just was like a ghost town everybody kind of went their own directions 
I talked to Ryan a few times throughout the process, but I didn't talk to anybody else I worked with the whole time. Like it became very much like a, your, your own tower of business. Like how do you handle yourself? Right. Right. So uh, tell me a little bit more about these t-shirts that you came up with then. So initially a lot of people, like you saw it throughout the tattoo world via social media. A lot of people were selling prints, just trying to find something that they could sell that wasn't a tattoo that you could do remotely pretty much. So I had done shirts in the past and had some success. I'd done uh, like sweatshirts two or three years ago and I sold quite a few of them, but it was always real challenge because the overhead on shirts is a lot to get a shirt made costs a lot. So I had an idea. I think the first, yeah, the first shirt was the Buck COVID shirt just because I was playing off that cancer movement. Like just and right. everybody at the time was like, this is not good. So right. I decided to draw a shirt. It was a dagger going through a COVID molecule. And that one I handled all via Instagram, DM, Venmo, and a poorly put together Excel spreadsheet. Like I hadn't used, <laughs> I hadn't used Excel in a while. Yeah. My Excel was real rusty, but I got it. I, and it was mostly clients at that point. I have a pretty well-established social media following. So when I think I sold about 60 of those shirts, which mm -hmm. for a lot of leg work and a lot of, like I used a local printer, kind of local, they're in Canyon City. Like going back and forth, getting that all done, took a couple weeks and I think I made like 500 bucks. But it was an indicator that like this could be, it's cash that's preventing me from having to like dip into our reserves early right. on. Right. So I made another shirt that kind of got lost in the shuffle. It was a... Uh, and these, this one was just strictly basically tattoo based. It had a skull with a headdress on the back of it. And then mm -hmm. the shop name and my name on the front. And that one was kind of a filler same, but in between the COVID one and that one, I had a lot of free time. So I said, why not build a big cartel website? Cause lots of artists use them. They're simple, they're cheap. Mm -hmm. So I put one together and it thankfully like ended up being a lifesaver cause it captured the information I needed, I learned how to, I got on stamps.com and got a, like a scale. And it was all kind of just <laughs> like, I didn't know what I was doing, trial and error, but it felt like I had, I got time. Like my baby sleeps twice a day. So I would just kind of wander around the internet. I found like stamps.com. I got a scale for free shipped to me. Mm -hmm. I used ShipStation, which is a software that made shipping easier. Cause also I was a little worried about going to the post office this early in the process. Like, how do I make this easier? Mm-hmm. Cause I have to mail 60 shirts, which seemed like a lot. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, it definitely was the small, small <laughs> amount of shirts I had to touch. But, uh, so I built this website and thought maybe like, and my wife too, she was pretty involved because she was, we're in 980 square feet. So she watched it all kind of happen and she had a lot of ideas. So then we started talking cause I wanted to do a shirt a week. Cause I figured if each shirt could produce $500, that would be all right. That would get us through this. And it was kind of rolling over. I had gotten caught up to the two weeks. So if I could like keep it, maybe each shirt took two weeks to come. But if I did one each week, it would kind of take us as far as we needed it to because we didn't know how long it was going to take either. This was still when the, the timeline was completely unknown, but it was working like it was money was coming in. It was relatively simple. I could do it all digitally. I drew it on my iPad and then emailed it to them. And we started going like making a list of ideas. Like how do we, and my wife had the idea to make a shirt with a nurse on it. Mm -hmm. Cause at that time, the 24 hour news cycle was just exploding with overwhelmed ICUs, particularly in New York, the right. buzzwords we heard about everything that was happening. So I did a shirt and it's based off the traditional tattoo design, the Rose of No Man's Land based on a song from World War One. The No Man's Land is the, the space between, you've got like one side and the other and then No Man's Land is where you kind of get caught. Right. And if you wanted to find help, the Red, Co Red Cross uh, nurses had the Red Cross on their hat and it looked like a rose in the fog of war. And that's what you were looking for. It was that ah. rose of no man's land to come save you. So I did my interpretation of that design. I've done it a bunch of times. I've painted it. I've painted flash. I've tattooed it before. So I did that. And then I added a banner underneath it said frontline warriors. I put it on there with the, the note, like I'm going to donate 20% of total sales, which was a, that was a tricky conversation because a lot of time you hear like 20% of profit, like how do I want to split this up? Because based on price assured and shipping and everything that I kind of learned over that, like probably maybe three weeks in to all of it was like, what's, what's my break even point. And then, all right, cool. So the profit was 12 bucks. So if I do 20%, I basically just split it. I get six and this charity gets six. Mm -hmm. So I put it on Instagram. Like I want to do this. I'm raising like 20% of total sales. I have to find a 
a charity first, but I'll let you guys know when I find that one. And even just that initial post without a specific charity attached to it in just my Instagram following sold about 84 shirts. And, and one of my clients actually reached out to me and said that this, she's going to school to be an EMT. And she said, Denver health has a foundation that's giving all their money directly to healthcare workers that either got COVID uh, we're out of work because someone they live with got COVID. We're either they're just directly affected by it and we're unable right. to work. So it made it easy. I did some brief internet research and I was like, all right, these guys are cool. Like I'll do that. And then once I had a specific charity attached to it and in just seeing in four to five days that I had sold 84 shirts, way more than any of the other ones did in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. I wanted to sell a lot more. So then I put on my public relations hat and sent at initially probably like 30 emails to different news outlets like everyone I could think of and then I found I went on Facebook and I'm friends with a guy who my wife went to high school with who does works for channel seven so mm -hmm. I sent him a message and he responded immediately and it was like and he immediately was like yeah I want to do this right so he brought a cameraman over uh we all wore masks and sat in my kitchen and I told him the shirt story and it took about a week and I think it was April 13th that the story was on channel seven and it went from like 90 shirts to 315 shirts almost overnight in probably 18 hours. Wow. So that's where the big cartel website came in because it captured yeah. all of it. Like it caught all that information I needed. It made it so that shipping was easier. I ran into some headaches through the, the whole thing because when I ordered, so I knew that it, like, it was going to be on the news. And I had no idea what it was going to turn into, but I knew that I probably needed more than the 80 shirts or 90 shirts that had been ordered. So I ordered 150 from my printer. And at mm -hmm. the time, they told me that 150 was the biggest order they'd ever gotten. Wow. Which should have been like a minor red flag, like maybe I should bring on another printer to help. But none of us knew what was about to happen. So we mm -hmm. went from 90 to 315. And when it was all said and done, I sold roughly, I think, like 550, nice. something like that. And it all came from that local printer. And it was her husband and her. Like, she did the marketing and the email and kind of customer relations. And he did the printing in their garage in Canyon City. Mm -hmm. And the shirts are beautiful. They're great. But it took probably almost seven weeks to get all of those shirts. So oh. there was a lot of, like, I went from a guy that was just doing tattoos to a customer service department because... Initially, it was a pre-order, and then people were like, all right, this pre-order is taking a really long time. So I got a lot of emails. Most emails were positive. But through that process, because at the same time, I want that, that basically halted any idea of doing a new shirt every week because right. it just became so overwhelming. But then as things kind of started to open up a little bit, I got like a couple shipments, and people started getting out, and then I got caught up and actually was able to get all the shirts that were shipped basically from the news day like the couple days around the news out. Cause that's where the biggest, like the peak of my uh, like bell curve was. So I, they all had their shirts. So everybody else's weight was shorter. Then I came out with another shirt. Like I, I wanted to continue doing that. Cause the first one, I think at that time, you know, now we're up to almost $5,000 donated. Wow. But at that time it's right around like 2000. And I wanted to do that for everybody. Cause it was pretty cool to be able to, donate like go on their little website and get the little email that said thanks for your donation now now since then I've, they've reached the denver health foundation's reached out to me they put they posted on their social media about us the frontline warrior ones we did like i thought my mom my mom works at children's hospital i'd heard her stories because she works in the er like how they'd seen more than most people thought like they they weren't getting the mainstream media because everyone knew that it was the older people the at-risk mm -hmm. community Right. So they were a little overwhelmed, not as much as some of the larger metropolitan hospitals, but I wanted to include them. So I made a shirt for them and it had a, a Cupid doll on the back of it, which is another classic tattoo design, mm -hmm. but it has, it's like a Cupid has childlike features. And I made him riding a COVID molecule with the banner and the verbiage, stay vigilant. Cause this was mm -hmm. towards I mean, not, not necessarily the end, but things were getting looser they were starting to open up different parts of the country so i needed to think just bigger like colorado obviously was the big one like most i'd say probably 30 40 percent of all of the shirts are in colorado mm -hmm. like to stay vigilant when everything was opening in different states that became the next one so 
I tried to partner with Children's Hospital directly, uh-huh. and they, they, they agreed, but they told me that I couldn't put the logo on the shirt. I could only put the logo on my website with the shirt, and anything I posted about the shirt, they had to approve. Oh, that's Which, fine. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, I'm, I'm not, like, a, like, real crazy, but I'm a little rough around the edges. Like, if you look at my social media close enough, like, I just talk like I'm talking to people. I don't really care. Term it like guerrilla marketing, like a lot mm-hmm. of story posts, a lot of Instagram. And I didn't want Children's Hospital to be involved in that, which I was, that's cool. Like I very kindly declined and said like, this is kind of how I want to do things. I'm still going to donate to them. Like they're, I've sold not as many of those. Like that was kind of a, brought me back down to earth because I thought I'd sell a 500 of every shirt. This is going to be amazing. But I think I've sold about a hundred of those ones. Mm-hmm. which is still incredible when you think about that first shirt selling 60, the middle shirt selling 35 or something like that. And then now it's in the hundreds. Mm-hmm. So now I'm officially in the t-shirt business. Right. So in the middle of the, the pink one, like that's what I call it. The frontline warrior shirt. There's that one's pink. The girl I went to high school with, her name's Jeannie Adams. She reached out to me and she called me and I, there was a lot going on and everyone was sending me emails and Facebook messages. Like, I saw you on the news. This is great. So it took me about a week to call her back. And I, the reason I called her back is I had an epiphany is she had done uh, marketing for property management companies, specifically like website management for property management companies for a really long time. And she had started her own consulting agency and I didn't know what exactly she was doing, but I was hoping she, maybe she knew how to work big cartel and make it look cooler. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My big cartel looked like if you, I don't know how old you are, but if you remember in the early 2000s, geo cities, you could build your, you could build your own website and it like kind of walked you through it. I had Mm -hmm. a couple of those for different video games I played, Mm -hmm. but it looked like that. It looked like it looked awful because I did it Mm -hmm. really fast. Thankfully though, like I want to write big cartel letter, but you saved me because I got, by the time I left Big Cartel, it was like 655 orders, mm-hmm. which was crazy. And it made it so easy because it synced with ShipStation. It did everything. It sent shipping emails and tracking and everything, like all in one place. It was super simple. But when you looked at my presentation of it, I don't know enough about computer website design to make it look cool. Because some people make them look great. So I right. thought I, I called Jeannie hoping she knew how to make them look great. And she said, I can do you one better. She has one of her partners specializes in e-commerce websites. So within like a, about 10 minutes, we were on a conference call for an hour and the name of the company is Launch Lab mm-hmm. and they do, like he does it all. Like, and they've been, finally, I felt like other than my shipping department and creative director, my wife, I had like a team around me that could help. And they took over and like he synced up all kinds of stuff so that, my Facebook and everything all work together. My Facebook's a store now. And that just made the management way easier. It led to the next shirt too, like that I had them on, on my side to make things like we, I've been talking to them this morning. We're getting ready for another shirt, but we're also moving towards that drop ship model where I don't have to manage all of it. Cause that's another thing too, is as you learn, I have to, I'm guessing a lot. Like when I made the current shirt, it's called 86 mm-hmm. and it's for restaurant workers, like Colorado restaurant foundation. Cause they're still out of work or underworked. Like I think yesterday they opened up at right. 50% capacity or a maximum of 50 people, which the example I've been using, if you think about Texas roadhouse, we like going to Texas roadhouse right down the street from us. 50 people in that place is 12 four top tables the texas yeah. roadhouse has 120 tables in it like that's insane that you would even try to open at that point just stick to the the grab and go model because you don't have to staff the like even half the restaurant to do that right which keeps restaurant workers underemployed so that this one is going it's got an 86 on the front if you've ever worked in restaurants you know 86 means it's done it's off the menu it's over we're out of it right and then I actually used the Swedish chef from the Muppets. I saw that one. I like that one a lot. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. I love it. It's one of my favorites. He's great. He just mumbles and you can't tell what he's saying. Mm-hmm. But he's got a COVID molecule. It looks kind of like a meatball, but it's a COVID molecule. So still playing with the times on a fork, like a big giant fork. 
I sold like I initially made a post about that because as I'm trying and I'm still emailing everyone too. This is like happening in the background. I've emailed so many news organizations. I ended up getting on Fox 31 and Channel 2, 303 Magazine, uh, Colorado Biz Magazine, mm-hmm. Westward. I'm going to come. There's an article going to be in a real tiny little paper called The Front Porch. And every time there was a little bit of a bump. And Fox 31 made a commercial out of it. Wow. Yeah, there's a, if they do, it's called like Front Range Courage or something. And they pick different little snippets of those stories and make commercials that run in, you know, in between commercial breaks. Nice. And I get, I, it was on again last night, which has helped maintain sales. But we're also, as everyone kind of comes out of their cocoons, we're noticing that the, that initial surge of wanting to help, wanting to give back is kind of going away, mm-hmm. which I think we see with any any disaster or tragedy right. like a hurricane or anything like that people show up hard in the beginning so the restaurant one yeah back to, back to what i was talking about the restaurant one i had to like i made an initial post the initial reaction it seemed a, like a lot like there was a lot of conversation on it on my instagram on my facebook a lot of like this is great it's gonna be awesome so in order to get ahead of it i thought this was gonna be another pink one I got a price break if I ordered 300 shirts from like 200 shirts. It was nine something a piece, 300 shirts. It was eight fifty. So I said, cool, let's do 300. They're going to sell. Everything's going to sell. Well, mm-hmm. I pick them up uh, on Friday and I've sold like 80 of them. So I'm going to have like <laughs> 220 banana cream shirts with the Swedish chef in my garage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm learning a little bit. So we're the launch labs working with me. We're going to do a drop ship model through one of those sites where I have to, I'm going to call like work directly with the site because they don't necessarily do the shirts the way I want them. Like I want to be involved because that's, that's my, the only thing I really bring to the table is the design element Mm -hmm. and I can't get the print on the shirt as big as I want. So I'm going to call them directly and try to work with them and see if I can do something. But the next shirt, it'll work through there so that I don't have to get the print made. I don't have to, ship it like if you order it it'll look like it's from our website it'll all be synced with our website the the presentation and the brand will remain the same but you order it they print it and they ship it to you Mm -hmm. and we bryce the guy that at launch lab said that i can even like if you order a shirt now you get i put a little thank you note in it from me and my family i put a sticker in it and he said that if we talk to them they'll do that too so nice in terms of the message that like i want the what is now a company to send because it wasn't always it wasn't like ever about just selling tattoo shirts and trying to make my family money because i was i mean like i said earlier i was splitting it with somebody else like a Mm -hmm. charity Mm -hmm. now the infrastructure is there and the experience is there i want to continue doing it forever like if i can just have a constant side business that is charitable t-shirts like t-shirts for a good cause then i want to keep doing it so that's where we're at now, actively trying to build that. There's, the next shirt is going to be for farmers. Mm-hmm. Like I just keep looking at large groups that have been directly affected by everything 2020 is thrown at us. I think they're hurting more than a lot of people know. I mean, when I go into it, I want to sell a million of every shirt, but mm-hmm. <laughs> who knows? But this right. one should be hopefully in the next like week or so. That one will be out. And then after that, we're doing a, a first responder shirt. I've gotten a lot of requests for that one, like police, firefighters, EMTs. Mm-hmm. So that one's pretty much ready for production, but I want to time that one with like July 4th, kind of that pro-America time. Right. But I've also found myself in this weird space because I want to, I want to help everybody. I want to donate to every charity that I can sell a shirt for. But like in the last 48 hours, I think most of America has seen what's going on in Minneapolis right now. Right. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to help. I don't, Mm. that Mm. one's a real touchy subject. And at the same time, if I help that group, does it alienate the first responder group that I'm going to try to help in a month or so? Like there's a lot of political gray area and I just want to help everyone. I don't really care. But if I... Cause I also too, I tattoo a bunch of police officers, like basically I'd say a dozen Douglas County sheriffs. Cause once you tattoo one of them, 
they're a real tight knit community so that they refer all of them to me. Mm -hmm. So I know too, that when I sell the, the first responder one that I've got a network already established that'll help push it for me. I tattoo a few firefighters. Some of my close friends are firefighters, but I also want to be able to like stay in the middle. I don't want like we in 2020, everybody puts you on one side or the other. I don't mm-hmm. want to be classified as that. I just want to be the dude who sells t-shirts. Right. So I might throw one of those in there, like in between the farmer and the first responder one, or I might bring that one out first. I don't know what it would be, but something related to just, I guess the, for lack of a better term, and, it, and you never thought it would be this 70 years later or whatever, but the current civil rights movement, which is weird. Yeah. yeah. So that's where the shirts are. There's a long, long story longer. Right. <laughs> I made some t-shirts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So is your shop working on its opening strategies? Are you guys already opened? Yeah, we opened on May 9th. Um, We jumped the gun a little bit because Governor Polis came out and said that May 1st was going to be when everybody could start getting back to business. So at the time, like I had, I had to move when COVID first showed up, I moved about three weeks of appointments and nobody knew. So we moved on about three weeks. Yeah, just give us a little time, let this calm down, and we'll come back. Well, then it started extending, so I moved those three appointments or three weeks of appointments again. And then he said May 1st, so I kind of opened up my Instagram and said, like, let's, let's start scheduling. May, May 1st is the day, woohoo. And then a day later, Mayor Hancock in Denver came out and said that it, it was going to be May 9th, like, yeah. which in hindsight, I think it was handled correctly because. Mm-hmm each individual section of the world was experiencing this whole thing differently. So I think it should have been left up to those tiny areas. Like how, what's happening in your city, what's happening in your town. So overall, I don't think it was a big deal. I also, I've said multiple times, like I understand that tattooing is a luxury. We don't like, I love it. Obviously. Like I, Mm -hmm. my, I gave up everything for it. I live in it every day, but we're not, when it comes to being non-essential, we're right at the top of the list because like, what, right. what do we do to benefit the whole of society? Not oh, I would argue to the benefit of tattoo artists. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> like me and my family, people that get tattooed, I understand the, the, mm. the mental aspect to it. Like it's, I think it's completely therapeutic. I, like, I'd rather talk to someone while getting tattooed than a therapist. I get it. Mm-hmm. But again, like, so the shutdown, I got it. Like it understood it though. So that wasn't a big deal. But Mm -hmm. so we found out it was May 9th. I started rescheduling everything, got everybody up and moving. And then as a shop, we were going to try to meet, but then we just kind of became like a group text message for the first time. And at that point, I think it was like nine weeks. We were all talking to each other. So we decided that we weren't, no one was going to do like, a regular schedule they weren't going to pack it full because the new restrictions were that you couldn't have similar to everywhere like you hear the social distancing you couldn't have 10 people in the shop at once which right it's that's a difficult conversation because there's seven tattooers and two helpers and like all right cool now we have to adjust everything like we're back but we're not back yeah so it became more about like most days other than, like i think it's thursday friday saturday is when the shop is the fullest Mm-hmm. other than that everyone's got staggered days off on just a normal schedule and there's never really more than three people four people tattooing but then we decided all right cool like just kind of tattoo when you can because now we're appointment only too we've got at least two guys who rely almost primarily on walk-ins like they're mm-hmm. just and we need them too because our shop like i said earlier is very walk-in heavy like we're a busy street shop we need walk-in guys but they're coming back to work like their appointment only structure they run out of appointments in a week because all the mm-hmm. all their clients that want to get tattooed by them get tattooed and now they're just waiting for walk-ins again so we had to adjust that a little bit but either way we decided to stagger it so, so there's a, so half of us schedule our appointments in the morning and then half of us schedule them in the afternoon so that there's mm-hmm. not they're not like that anymore like i get i show up like about a half hour before my appointment i do all my drawing at home like I used to hang out at the shop and draw and wander around and talk shit to everybody. Mm-hmm. But now I draw at home. I show up to the shop about a half hour before I get set up. I tattoo and I leave right after like today, my appointments at one 
I'll get there about 1230, probably take about two hours and then I leave. Mm -hmm. You wear a mask the whole time, which is like, I understand all of it. Like, do you have, there's a new waiver now that like that you have to sign? Like, did you have COVID? Have you re-around anyone mm -hmm. within the last two weeks? I think it's the time frame. but we're back, which is cool. Like I'm definitely grateful for that, but it's, it's just not the same. It's not the tattoo and I love. Right. It's different. It's I different. Think, and, and I think and the whole world the, is now too. So Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, I find myself getting just grateful for going anywhere. It's like, yes, yeah, I'll wear yeah. the mask. I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah. Just you know, I'm just let me go somewhere other than the frickin' grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So sick of the grocery store. It's yep. the only the only entertainment I've had. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still like think about it, like in the middle of April. Like it was entertainment, but it was also terrifying. Like <laughs> everyone just like this before masks were a thing, like before yeah. they were required. Yeah. Which now, like now, it's just normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, and then that's one of the, my favorite parts about t tattooing is I meet new people every day. Every day, I, someone else comes in. Maybe it's a client that I see a lot, but for the most part, a new person comes into my life every day. So I get to talk to them about who knows what, but I get to talk to a new person about something every day. And post COVID, COVID topic of conversation, and many people echo what you're saying. I'm just glad to be doing something, like to get mm -hmm. out of the house. To uh, the woman I tattooed yesterday, I tattoo her and her husband all the time. I tattoo them a lot, and she came in. She said the same thing. Like being at home was great. Like they have a three year old. She said it was cool, but I just needed to do something else. Like just not be at home. Like they both got to work from home. She said it was really great being like around each other all the time but it's like, i need to talk to somebody else just like, that's not like even like we all got real used to facetiming or zooming talking to different members of our family but to just like see someone in person is a powerful thing like humans are social creatures so that's oh, yeah. an, like that's cool to be able to offer that through tattooing i loved that before now we just have to do it with a mask on so we can't really hear each other like what yeah your voice is muffled yeah yeah Okay, so, and now we get to one of my favorite parts of the show, which is the tattoo of the day. So, yeah, usually you make people talk about one of their tattoos, but yeah, I, yeah. You know, obviously as an artist, it's like you have many, I assume. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, what's your favorite piece? Either one that you've done or one that you own? Oh, man, I feel like I could talk about this forever. Um, <laughs> like, like everything else, like you've seen, I just ramble on, go 900 different directions. There's a couple, I mean... Obviously, I love like the big tattoos, the, the fun images to tattoo, which at this point in my career, all the work I've done, I tattoo basically in my style every day. I, I do tr American traditional tattoos with kind of a modern twist on them. Mm -hmm. But one tattoo that like gives me goosebumps just thinking about it, a guy came in, and it's, it's a sad one, but it was just like, a, it gave me like a real intimate look at like how powerful tattoos can be. So this guy... He was like a couple months younger than me and his wife had just died unexpectedly. So I'm 36. Mm -hmm. This was a couple years ago and he was still like visibly like shaken. You could see like he was just rough and he was with his, like there was a couple, they were married and they were like him and his wife's best friends. They were like couple best friends that did everything together. He had just moved in with them because of everything. She just died suddenly of a, like a heart condition that nobody knew about. Mm -hmm. and she was from Nepal so he came in and wanted to get a llama tattooed on him because they're like really big in Nepal or maybe it was an alpaca but whatever like same looking animal and he just wanted an outline of it and in the tattoo world and in the tattoo shop when you put something on someone's arm there's a certain way it should go and mm -hmm. you've probably seen memes about it but a lot of times people get like writing on their wrists and oh, it's for me I want it facing me which I get I have my mom and dad's signatures on my wrist and they face me because I don't give a shit. But there's a lot of jokes about it. Like, oh, it's upside down, technically. Like, you wouldn't put this shirt image facing me. It's not for me. It's like a forward-looking thing. But when I put the, the outline on him to, like, see where he wanted it, I didn't even think twice about it. I just pointed it at him because it was just for his wife. And he I was like, yeah, that's perfect. And it was just an outline of a llama, real simple, not real big, just right on his forearm. Mm-hmm. And when I got done, I had to like walk out of the shop because I thought I was going to start crying. It was heavy. Like, but yeah. it was to see 
like how much it meant to him in the middle of something like that too. Not, not two years later or six months later. Like dude, this shit was, it was hurting him like right then. Yeah. That was powerful. Like, in, and then he came back like the next day with this little tiny llama made out of uh, like basically like thread, really cool little thing that was from Nepal that they had at their house. He brought it and gave it to me. Oh, it's still like, it's still on my station and it's, like tattoos are awesome in that way. And if you haven't like experienced it, like uh, everyone like that, obviously you love tattoos. Everyone's got different reasons for getting tattooed. I think you don't need a reason. I just think they're badass. And if you just want to get one, get the biggest one you can. Mm-hmm. But when you experience that side of tattooing, like the almost spiritual side of it, it's pretty intense. Like in, it makes you want to do it all the time. I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know if I can mentally do those kind of tattoos all the time but and my even my wife who obviously lives in tattoos with me even she thinks I'm a little crazy when I talk about tattooing on that level but until you've had that that intimate experience with another human that way and like helping them heal and helping them try to move on from a devastating situation Mm -hmm. you don't fully understand it and I try to convey that every once in a while but it was pretty incredible. And then obviously like there's some fun ones out there that are just like, if you look at my Instagram or my social media presence, I do, they're called grill tattoos. Like just basically teeth with diamonds all over them. Mm-hmm. And I do a bunch of those. Like last year they caught on and I did, I don't even know how many, but I did an ice cream cone made out of mouths with a bunch of diamonds in it. I did it see was, that one on your yeah, on that your, was super your page. That was yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did a, I did a Sunday built out of the same things. Like so in terms of just fun tattoos, those were more fun. But that one, the llama sticks in my head all the time. Right. Great. So we're uh, pretty much out of our time. So Nate, Sweet. how can people get a hold of you? So if you go all of it's uniform, it's Nate Stevens tattoo, N A T E S T E P H E N S tattoo. That's my Instagram. That's my Facebook. I just last night changed my, changed my Instagram handle to that so that everything's uniform and branded and correct. My website is natestevenstattoo.com. Basically type that in and, and you'll find me. Like you said, you can just Google it. Like, I don't remember the last time I wrote www.anything, but you right. just type Nate Stevens Tattoo into the internet and it'll find me. Great. Great. So Nate, thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, I am, of course, Donna Shannon, Personal Touch Career Services. Just Google that. And as my producer always reminds me, uh, if you like what you heard here, give us a like, give us a follow. If you didn't, keep it to yourself. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll catch you next time.